Hey, I am so excited about interviewing Luke Kite, who is the head of culture at Redico in the UK, who has been named multiple times, you know, best place to work. I think you're the best place to work in the, in the uh, city where you're actually located. So Luke, thank you so much for taking the time and being, being on this, uh, this interview. No problem, thank you for having me. So I actually came across you on LinkedIn and I started reading about the company and I was really fascinated with what y'all are doing. So at uh, the association, we really are intent on driving an evolution at work. Uh, I give the statistics all the time. People are probably tired of me talking about it, but it's just ridiculous what passes for work for so many people and just the, the, the absolute beat down that it is for a lot of people out there. And it sounds like you guys have done some, some really significant things that makes that not the case at your workplace. So talk about how that, you know, evolution started at Redico and, you know, maybe a little bit, what was it like before and why did y'all make this change? And then the kind of results that you're getting. Sure. So I suppose beforehand, we were very much like an ordinary company. So everyone would come in and do their nine to five, five days a week. They would have sort of managers, all that kind of stuff. So very much hierarchical, um, very much kind of run in a very standard way, I suppose. We have always focused on trying to make the company a good place to be, but we always focused on the wrong things. So for a lot of the time, it was events and nights out and free food in the office and all that kind of stuff that we thought people wanted. But in reality, it was, it was very much different. And we started to do internal feedback and scores from the team over how happy they were. We were using the MPS system internally and thinking we'd have a, an excellent, a world-class score, it came back that it was only a good. And some of the feedback was around unnecessary management. So someone might ask their line manager if they can work from home. That line manager might say yes. Another person will ask their line manager and that line manager might say no. And so suddenly you get frustration and confusion about why some people can do it and some people can't. There was kind of just, I suppose people just didn't have the freedom to work in a way that was right for them. It was still very much controlled by the company and in what hours people could work. And in an industry like we are, where it's all digital, it's all online, it doesn't need to be the case. And actually there was more power in giving freedom to the team to be able to control how they worked. And so all this feedback and looking at, some of the radical businesses around the world that focus on trust and freedom and responsibility. We put together a big manifesto, sort of 6,000 words, on all the changes in the company we wanted to make and roll out. And this was sort of about 18 months to two years ago now, so about 2018. Um, this included things like unlimited holiday, letting people work from home whenever they wanted to, letting people choose their own hours, paying for all sickness, scrapping managers and, and having coaches that people could pick themselves, let people choose their own targets. So moving away from a, a kind of completely normal company in the way it was run to one that was based on trust and freedom and responsibility and giving the team complete control over how and when and where they work. And this is, I suppose it was a, a massive shift from a mindset perspective because you, a lot of people, don't go for this kind of approach because of the fear of what might happen. Oh, everyone's going to take the mic. Everyone's going to abuse the system. Chaos. No Cats gonna... and dogs sleeping together. I mean, it's just utter chaos. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's, it's, a real, it's a real hard thing to kind of get your head around at first into how it might work. Myself, I, when this kind of manifesto came out, I didn't think it would work. So I was sitting there thinking, oh, this, this isn't sustainable. It might work for a couple of months, but eventually just something will go wrong. But rolling it out and getting the team involved and really pushing this across a period of sort of nine to 12 months to show what was possible when you give that power and responsibility to the team. And ever since, we haven't looked back. So it's all been really smooth running, I suppose. The company has gone from strength to strength. We've had our highest ever sort of revenue results, our highest ever profit as a company. The team MPS has jumped up to a world class. Our client MPS has also gone to world class. So despite giving that complete freedom to the team, clients are happier as well, which shows that they're happier the team, they're happy the clients, that actually does work. Um, so everything really has gone up, which is, I suppose, what we wanted to see, but also shows that this approach is right and that giving the team complete control over how they work is the right way to do it if you want to improve the business and especially the culture within it. 
Okay, so I love Luke, your statement that you didn't think it was going to work, you know, and, nice. and this is what a lot of people are out there. They're going to be listening to you say this, uh, and they're going to be going, well, that would never work at my company. That wouldn't work in my industry. That wouldn't work in. But we have example after example. I, I interviewed a couple of weeks ago, um, Gary Ridge, the CEO of, of uh, WD40 exceptional growth with that company when they focused on culture as being their, you know, their core essence and making the kinds of changes. Uh, so what a great testimony that you're able to give of saying, Hey, not only did this work, but it's yielded, you know, better customer response, better, you know, I'm assuming em employees are much happier. And uh, I don't even like the word employees, by the way, with the team. Right, members, right? So, uh, um, so, that is that is fantastic. Have there been any bumps along that road uh, or setbacks? Yeah, so I suppose there have been a lot of challenges and a lot of lessons learned because with each part of the manifesto presenting its own problems that might happen. I mean, even rolling out something such as giving the team complete freedom over how they worked. At the very start, I was thinking, okay, so at the moment we're sort of around the 25 mark in terms of team size. So if you've got 25 people, maybe working 25 different work patterns, taking annual leave whenever they wanted to, working from home whenever they want to, how is that controllable? How can you regulate that and make sure it works and everyone knows where people are and can communicate? And even with things like that, the obvious answer is normally the wrong one. So the obvious answer is to create guidelines and rules around how it might work. Right. But that's actually not, the, it's the complete opposite, which is the best way to do it, which was, is to have no rules. So actually, the whole notion behind this kind of stuff is to free people up and give them responsibility. All rules are doing is taking away that freedom. So the best way to do it is to simply say, look, you now have complete responsibility over what you're going to do. Show us what you can do. There's no rules around it. Just go ahead and be responsible, be adults, because a lot of this stuff is just treating people like adults and saying, you now have that power to, to do what you want and when you want. Um, so kind of show us what you can do. Obviously, there's, there's bigger issues around management side of things. So we scrapped managers completely from the company and moved towards a different way of looking at kind of leads within circles. So I, I don't know if you know things around sociocracy or tier organizations, all that yes. kind of stuff. Yeah, so we, we've kind of done a hybrid of, of that, where we have a, a lead of a department who's responsible for growing that and, be responsible for the PL, but don't have any kind of people elements to their role because there's this crazy stat where 49% of people would take a pay cut to a different manager. So we wanted to get rid of that completely. So we've got people that are still accountable for growing a department, but there's no people element to that whatsoever. So the management problems are still around like who sets salaries, who does annual reviews. So we've had to kind of approach each of those problems with a bespoke solution to make it work for us. So we scrapped annual, annual reviews, um, salary reviews that are done completely differently to how they were done before. Um, people are elected to be part of a salary panel, so voted for by the team. So again, all the problems that we faced are bespoke to us, which is the same as what I suppose, I get people that speak to me on LinkedIn or come in to chat about how things work and how it might work for my industry or how can we solve this problem. But actually the best way to solve these problems is to speak to the team and get them to give you the solutions because you don't have to have all the answers. And I suppose a lot of the time I was trying to think of the best way forward or the right way to do it, when actually it's the rest of the team that are gonna be running with it and doing it on a day-to-day -day basis. So the chances are they will have the answers to the questions that people will have on how things might work. So speak to them, find out what questions they've got, get the solutions from them, and that can really drive it forward rather than one person trying to dictate how it could work going forward. Getting the team involved is, is the best solution really. So Luke, I, I'm just listening to you. And uh, first of all, I'm overjoyed because I love when a company gets it right, uh, which y'all are clearly doing. And I, yeah, I tell people all the time, this isn't hard. It, mm. Having a great culture is not hard, right? Didn't no. cost you any money. It didn't, it did, but it took um, a, a paradigm shift. And I think that's the absolute breakdown that we are experiencing. We're still working off a, a, uh, 70, 100 year old paradigm with factories and, you know, punch a clock and you got to have bosses and people, you know, looking over things. And when you just release people into autonomous 
kind of situations, most people are going to thrive in that organization. Um, I work for myself. Nobody tells me when to get up, when to go to bed, when to start work, when to stop work. And guess what? I just, I probably work yeah. more than I would if I was punching a <laughs> clock somewhere, right? Uh, yeah, I absolutely. always, every time I ask a, uh, an Uber driver, hey, you know, and they'll say, oh, I was in corporate America or I was doing, you know, whatever in whatever part of the world. And I said, well, you know, and I just got tired of it. So, well, you know, what time did you get up this morning? Oh, I started driving at five o'clock, right, to get the, the airport runs. And it's amazing that they do discretionary effort when they're, quote, working for themselves that yeah. they never would have done because the company wasn't set up for them to be successful doing that. So mm -hmm. all you've done is just remove all of those, those soul-sucking barriers to people bringing their A game. And yeah. it sounds like as a result, you're getting people's A game. Um, yeah, absolutely. And it's kind of, I suppose, the problem with the way a lot of businesses are set up nowadays, or well, not nowadays, but over the last 40, 50, 60 years, is that everyone's pigeonholed into the same routine. So for no real reason, companies work nine to five, five days a week. And there's no real kind of wriggle room around that. There's no, people don't have that freedom outside of that. When actually everyone is so different and is productive in their own ways at different times. Some people will kind of wake up in the morning and love to get cracky straight away. Maybe they're at a six, seven, eight o'clock starter. Some people can't do that at all. Yeah, they've still got to be in at exactly the same time as, as the other person. Some people can work late at night and the night hours and can go from six, seven, eight o'clock in the evening. Other people, that's their worst nightmare. But what companies do is they force everyone to do nine to five, five days a week, rather than letting people work out when they can be most productive, which Absolutely. is a massive flaw, really. If we're all so different, why not give the individual that responsibility to work out when they're most productive? And as you say, you'll get more from the person by simply handing over the keys to that freedom. I, so I, I wrote a book called, uh, which I'll send you if we haven't already, but uh, called A Company of Owners. And, it's, and I speak a lot on that topic. And mm -hmm. sometimes when people ask me the question, well, how do I get people to act like owners? The super short answer is <laughs> treat them like owners. Yeah. Treat them like an owner. Treat them like an adult. Yeah, um, absolutely. I had, a, I had a guy tell me one time, he is a manager, and, and everybody hated this guy. And I said, why, do people, every, why does everyone hate you so much? He said, because grown men, it, this was a very male-dominated industry, grown men don't like to be told what to do. And I said, well, stop telling them what to do. <laughs> I mean, here's an obvious solution. Yes. I, in his mind, it, that's, you know, that's why they hate me because that's what my job is as a manager and the boss. And it, you know, um, when you free people up, it's mm -hmm. incredible what they bring to the table and their creativity and it, it, it's just an absolute deal changer. So what would you say to um, someone who's thinking, they've just heard what you described and what y'all have done. Um, what would you say to them about where to start? Uh, because it, yeah. it, it, it seems to me there's an, old, there, there's an old saying, if you're gonna cut the tail off the dog, don't do it one inch at a time, right? <laughs> and you can ease your way into the kind of changes you're talking about, but it, almost can be a uh, anesthetic effect of then they don't get the results. It's not, it really has to be kind of an all or nothing shift or does it, you know, in your experience? Yeah. Um, so I think one of the biggest problems that a lot of companies will face is that whoever owns the company, whether it's the leadership team, board of directors, the CEO, you need to get them on board. And a lot of the time, it's the people that are in these high positions aren't actually on board with this. So obviously, the biggest challenge at first is, is getting whoever it is, that higher power, to really see sense. Now, fortunately for us, this cultural change initially was driven by the directors of the business. Okay. So they saw what was happening and kind of identified that this needed to change. So from us, from our point of view, that was obviously a great thing that they were on board straight away and were really pushing this forward and really driving it forward. Private companies, that's going to be a lot more difficult if that CEO isn't actually on board of it to begin with. Ooh. Obviously, if they are, if you can drive it forward, the team is the best place to start because they're the ones that know what the common problems and frustrations are. Absolutely. So, and uh, I, I agree 100% because I've seen companies where they decide to do something different mm -hmm. 
And all it takes is an eye raise from the CEO or a look of, you know, whatever. And it, it will shut it down. There, there, I did uh, some work for a very, very large company and they had what they called the pocket veto. They would get all the execs in a room, all 18, whatever, they would agree to uh, decision making. And then walking out of the room, one of the senior people would say, well, so, you know, we'll see if that works or something. And it was done. It was just dead mm -hmm. in the water. Yeah. And so it really has to be leadership that is, that is uh, walking, walking yeah. the, the talk. Uh, if it's going to be effective, and and the best and the best way I suppose to to really convince someone like that to switch is with case studies and proven results, and I suppose looking at companies like Redico and and very similar companies that have taken that plunge, potentially at the time a lot of people thought it might not work. Again, like myself, but showing that it, it does work and it can work, and these are the results you can get from it. Sort of taking these sort of case studies and results to those CEOs and, and board of directors and kind of showing kind of what is possible when you switch that mindset and focus on people rather than the process. Okay, so give us a quick snapshot of Redico. How many employees, you know, what, what's the, the core, you know, focus of the company and, and all of that? Yeah, so predominantly we focus on um, search marketing. So it's SEO and PPC. Um, we've got 25 people in the company. We're spread across sort of three locations in the UK. Uh, we've got sort of massive plans, I suppose, as a company to get to 50 by the end of next year with a 5 million turnover. Every single year over sort of the last sort of three or four years, we've increased quite significantly with revenue and profit. And this sort of cultural shift is now part of that as well. So I suppose you can only get so far by focusing on, on targets and numbers. But now with this kind of cultural shift and the ambitious plans of the company from that perspective, it's kind of really helping us to sort of push forward and sort of maximize those those plans sort of next year and in the future so in terms of a company we founded in 2012 so about seven years eight years old now um but sort of heavy growth expected and obviously with culture like this it really does help from a recruitment side um, we predominantly find it difficult to recruit in seo because we're very picky in making sure that we've got really good people um, which has kind of been a flaw i suppose in that we've been too picky but now, obviously, with this culture side, it should help with recruitment. And being just outside of London, we're hoping to kind of bring more people from London into the company as well. And with sort of working from home options and remote options, that makes it even easier to, to continue growing. It's, it's, uh, it is definitely, everybody wants to attract and retain top talent. And the number one way to do that is to have a great, be a great place to work. Yeah. I was re reading recently that every time Patagonia, uh, post a position they have nine thousand applicants for it and i always think that you know if if your recruiting is coming from people who work there that says something pretty incredible yeah. about the culture because they want their friends and family to come be a part of it so um well i hope you you hit that 50 mark and <laughs> and you know just just keep going because it sounds like it's well deserved and you you guys are really uh, leading leading the charge so we're about to be neighbors, by the way. I'm, my wife and I are in the process of moving to uh, Portugal, it looks like. Oh, okay. Oh, wow, yeah. nice. <laughs> yeah, and that's probably where we're uh, somewhere there or close to there where we'll do uh, the first big conference when we get that ready to roll out for the Global Gummy Culture Association. So consider yourself oh, invited already. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. well, okay. Thing, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, the thing is this, this kind of thing, companies are going to fall behind if they don't start focusing on culture. It's, it's one of those things where if you don't do it now, you're not going to be able to retain people. You're not going to be able to attract people. You're just going to fall behind as a company and people are just going to sort of usurp you, I suppose. So they're going to become non existent. They're going to actually go out of business. Right yeah. And I yeah. don't think people realize, but you know, I was at a, at a uh, uh, meeting the other day and I'm standing around talking to, a uh, bunch of older people, let's just say, of which I'm one. So, but it was kind of my peers. I'm I'm 57, and they were talking about which this is the conversation is so exhausting to me. But they were talking about oh millennials, you know these millennials, they just don't want to work. And I'm thinking that's nonsense. That's yeah. not true. And they were talking about well, you know the old saw of back when I, I just went to work and we got a paycheck and why can't they just be happy with that? And I'm thinking, you're done. 
you, are, <laughs> you know, unless you change that mindset and realize that people don't want that anymore and they're already voting with their non engagement, why can mm. you not see that? So your story is going to be a big encouragement to a lot of them. Uh, how do people get in touch with you if they want to get in touch with you? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm obviously LinkedIn. Um, I'm also on, on an email, so luke.kite at redico.co.uk. We've also been blogging a lot of the changes to the company, so just go on redico.co.uk as well, and you'll find all sort of the cultural revolution posts I've been putting out over the last year or so. Um, and yeah, my, the big thing for me is just to go for it. You, you've got to. Yeah, I love it. Okay, Luke, this has been an absolute delight. I look forward to meeting you in person at some point, uh, especially when we're over in that part of the world. So good. thank you so much for coming on and sharing the, the, the evolution of your company. And hopefully it'll be a big encouragement to some other companies that they can, they can do the same. So let's make, let's make this world of work a much, much better place. And the whole world's going to be happier when we do that. So <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Cheers. Thank you, Luke. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.